turn this morning to Hebrews chapter 4, starting with the 15th verse. That's Hebrews chapter 4, starting with the 15th verse. That's Hebrews chapter 4, starting with the 15th verse. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in kind of need. He understood the Many people start to think, think of God as being somebody all the way out here that just cannot be touched, that cannot be reached, that cannot be affected by things. But the fact, the fact is that Jesus Christ came to earth, became man, and experienced what it was to be human. And because of that, He understands us. He knows what we go through. He knows what we experience. And because He knows that, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Too many are afraid to take and come to God. It's amazing how many people, well, God just doesn't want to be bothered by that. Yes, He does. Yeah. He wants to hear anything that's bothering you. Any need or any concern you may have, from the greatest to the smallest, there is nothing that He does not want you to bring to Him. Amen. And we don't have to go like a beggar. We can come boldly. Amen. Because when we accepted Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, we become part of His family. So we don't have to take and crawl to Him we can run to Him. Amen. And God wants us to come running to Him. He wants us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. When we, uh, when we take and... Wrath is more than just being upset. Wrath is where you take and let your anger fester. And you become bitter about it. Now, there are some good examples of that kind of praying in the Bible. Because you go into Psalms and David prayed that God would kick his enemy's teeth out. You know, they're pretty wrathful prayers. But God wants us to be forgiving. And for us to experience the blessings and the movement of God, we have to be forgiving. We can't be wrathful. So if something, if somebody's made us upset and we and we haven't let go of it, we need to forgive them and let it go to receive the blessings of God. Anyway, holding on to wrath doesn't hurt anybody but you anyway. That's right. <coughs> it sits there and eats you alive, and the person you're angry at. Most of the time I don't even know it. It's better just to forgive them and turn it loose. And then come to God without doubt. <coughs> it's amazing how many people I've talked to over the course of my ministry that have told me, well, 
yes, Brother Stan, I would take that to God, but he really wouldn't do anything about that. Give him a chance. Come expecting. Let him say no. If he's going to say no. But we come expecting to get results. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. When a child asks their parent for something, they expect to get it. They're always a little surprised when they don't get it. We need to come to God that way. Expecting results. Expecting God to do great things in our midst. He knows what we are going through. He knows how to fix it. He wants to take care of it. All we have to do is give it to Him. And let Him handle it. Prayer is the most powerful weapon the Christian has. Amen. So often, people take and have asked me in the past, well, how... Have you, when you've seen results in church, what has been the catalyst? What did you do that brought, well, that brought the change? And my answer is always the same. And I always get this look like, you've got to be kidding me. Because my answer is always prayer. You want a church to grow? Pray for it. You want people saved? Pray for it. You want a solution to a problem? Pray for it. And believe. Because He's got all the answers. He's got the solutions. He's got the methods. You want healing? Reconciliation? Pray for it. God is this miraculous, loving being that is beyond our comprehension. Yes, we're created in His image, which means that we know He's similar to us, but greater in every aspect. And being, being like us and making us in His image he wants the best for us. And He knows everything going on with us. And those we are in contact with. <clears throat> so, we have no reason not to come boldly to the throne of grace. And expect results. Jude, verse 20. Beloved, building up yourselves as on your mo most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. There has been a lot of things said about praying in the Holy Ghost. And most of which has been very esoteric. I'm going to take him and try to simplify things as simply as I can. Praying in the Holy Spirit simply is praying, allowing Him to lead us in His will. Letting Him take and guide our prayers. Letting Him take and direct the path. Where 
we know we're praying in God's will. If we're in God's will, we know He's going to say yes. So we have no reason to doubt it, because it's His will. We'll see results. We'll see things happen. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start with the 19th verse. That's Matthew chapter 18, starting with the 19th verse. Again, I say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth touching anything, that ye shall ask, it shall be done for them. For my father of my Father which is in heaven, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. Now, here it's pointing out that where two or three that corporate prayer. It's amazing the power of corporate prayer. When we take and pray together and for each other, we see results that we might or that we would not achieve on our own. <coughs> corporate prayer does something. Now it doesn't change who God is. So it's got to be something involving us. But we do know that where he dwells is in our midst. And he works mightily when the saints pray. So it is important that we uphold each other's concerns, each other's needs, that we actually take and lift them all up to the Father. So that he has all of our concerns and that we are caring one for another. We have prayer lists and we never, we couldn't possibly put all our concerns on a prayer list. I don't believe that the list in the bulletin even comes close to all the concerns. Couldn't. But we need to pray for each other and uphold each other's concerns even if they're not on the list. Amen. In fact, I have yet to see a scripture anywhere in the Bible that doesn't say that we, that says that we can't uphold each other's concerns before they become a concern. We can pray preemptively before the problem takes place. And we may never know what, God's, what God has done. Amen. We need to uphold each other's loved ones who are not saved. Be taking them to the throne of grace and praying for them. Be taking and praying for each other's health long before anybody takes and tells you they're feeling bad. We need to take and bring God's people before the throne. But as God's people, we also need to be bringing sinners before the throne. We all, as a, pe as a people of God, if we've accepted Jesus Christ, have the privilege of coming to the throne of grace at any time, any place, anywhere. And he'll receive us. The sinner doesn't have that option. The only prayer the Lord wants to hear from the sinner is, Lord, please forgive me. 
So it is important that we stand in the gap and that we pray for the sinners. That we uphold them before the Lord so that God can protect them until they get saved. Because it's a horrible thing for a person to die lost. Our prayers may be that make the difference between whether they make it to heaven or hell. And we may never see the results of our prayers. But that doesn't mean that they're not being answered. It just means it's not being answered in our time. I've known many a person that stated that they were prayed for for years before they came to Christ. And in many cases, the person praying for them was dead by the time they got saved. Didn't mean that the prayer didn't work. It worked. They got saved. We shouldn't have to see everything to believe it. We know that God works together for our good. He works together for our benefit. He works together for the family of God. And He works together to make more people the family of God. John chapter 9, verse 31. John chapter 9, verse 31. <laughs> now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. That is why we need to stand in the gap. The Bible says we are a royal priesthood, a peculiar nation. As a priesthood, the job of the priest is to stand and mediate between God and man. To stand in the gap. To bridge that gap. To bring man to God and to bring God to a man, to man who does not know him. That's our mission. To stand in the gap. And being that God listens to us and not to them, then we need to be standing in the gap for the sinners. And all the more so. Because time isn't getting any longer. It's only getting shorter. Now I have no clue. I'm not, gonna, I'm not one of these that goes through and says, Oh, Lord going to come back at such a I don't know when he's coming back. Don't claim to know when he's coming back. I just know it's going to be sooner rather than later. That's all I know about it. But I do know that he's coming back for some of us before he's coming back for the rest of us because some of us aren't going to live forever. The fact is, is that every one of us has that little dash between birth and death on the tombstone. That's the time period that all of us have, that little dash. And for some, that little dash is longer than for others. Some people die in their childhood. Some people die throughout their years. Some live to be up in their golden age. But the fact is, is that little dash is the time period we have to turn and accept Christ. And if that, during that dash, we don't know Him, we always are in peril because we don't know when the end will be.
My wife has had some family in the past that has died in some very sudden accidents. She had a stepbrother that died in a motorcycle accident. Well, after a motorcycle accident. He didn't have a mark on his body. But it's, it's still, he still died. And he was in his 20s. Shelley's mother got hit by a truck down in Splendora. She was, a, she was 53. We never know when that time is going to be. Very few people are like my dad when they take and told him how long he was going to last. They told him he would, that with the cancer he had, he'd make it less than, than two months, and he made it a month and a half. Most people don't have that kind of the knowledge. The key is to be ready whenever it is. And when we know somebody isn't ready, we need to be really heartbroken and praying that they become ready. And I'm getting feedback galore here. <laughs> we need to take and be upholding them until they come to Christ, until they're ready. And then pray for them afterward, because they always need support. Yeah. <clears throat> so the biggest battles people face is right after they get saved. Let's pray for them. Uphold them. Let them see God working. Let them know the experience the power of God. Because God hears you. And He answers your prayers. And He answers every prayer of a Christian in one of three ways. Yes, no, and wait. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time with that wait part. It's tough to wait. Yes, it is. <laughs> But if we do wait, we'll see great things happen. Amen. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for, uh, for we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now that particular scripture has been mangled, mutilated. People seem to miss that last part there that cannot be uttered. But God doesn't require us to say a word. He knows our feelings deep inside. And we're so burdened that we cannot speak. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do next. He hears us and He answers. That's right. Thank you, Lord. He knows what we need. That doesn't mean he doesn't want us to pray. But when things get so heavy that we cannot pray, he communes with our soul and we pray. We need don't say anything. Because we can't. I've seen the saints come to the altar and pray, and all they did was cry.
You very rarely see someone with a burden like that anymore. Sometimes we have to pray for a burden. Pray that God give, uh, places somebody on our hearts that we can care for. That we can pray for. That we can uplift and hold before the throne of grace. And God will bless them. And God will bless you. And great <coughs> things will take place. And we'll see God moving. Healings will take place. Lives will be restored. Broken homes mended. Because God is great.